around you, please. Good afternoon. Y'all be seated, please. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody and our guest and uh, ask everybody, if you will, to look at your bulletin and for the, uh, to the rest of the month of October and the part of November's on it. And uh, don't forget about the things that are going on. And uh, kind of lost for words for a minute, <laughs> but I want, I would ask everybody to remember Brother Ben and them as they're on this mission trip. Remember the Fort family that lost the their daughter, and uh, remember Miss Carolyn's brother that's having heart surgery tomorrow. Is there anyone else? Any other announcements? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come today to thank you for your blessings, and we ask, Lord, that you would watch over us. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Lord, I ask that you be with all these that were sick, all these mentioned, all these on our prayer list. Lord, be with those who have lost loved ones. Lord, be with those that are traveling and give them traveling mercies and bring them back to us. Lord, and we thank you for Brother Steve who's come this today to bring us your word, and we ask, Lord, that you bless him. 
to give him the word that you want him to bring to us. Lord, I ask that you be with all of us as we go in the next few days our separate ways and light, lead us and guide us. And Lord, just help us all to be a shining light for you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Now, Brother Steve, when Miss Ann gets through, you can come on it. He's been here often enough. We just we just tell you what to do, don't we, Steve? Just <laughs> uh, take your hymnals now and turn to hymn 485. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. This is our operatory hymn. So let's sing together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. He
mountain, he took my place. And some day, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Through say something I'm glad to have him back singing with us <clears throat> now I have been and was I guess I should say I was in youth ministry for about uh, 15 years full time and I never understood these guys and D-Ray, if you're like this, I apologize. But I never understood these guys who wanted to throw out all the good old stuff. All those songs like Because of God's Amazing Grace. And even stuff like Mansion Over a Hilltop and, and Cloudless Day. I, I was raised on that stuff. And, and in a lot of the good old hymns, there's a lot of great theology that we should cling to and understand. And, it, and so it's worth... It's worth singing. Now, I've also never understood the folks who don't like the new stuff. Because in the new stuff, there's a lot of great theology and worship and, and worship to be had. And, and uh, at some point, that old stuff was new stuff. Just think about that. I'm not going to say if anyone might remember when the old stuff was new stuff. But I'm just saying, Brother Tommy, I'm just saying. Yeah, I, well, I love you, man. It is, it's been good to be with you today and, um, and share with you. And as you guys know me, I, I feel like I'm less of a preacher and, uh, and more of like the teaching type. <clears throat> you know, my, my dad, I, I thank you guys for putting your services on YouTube for one thing because I'll go and, and watch them sometimes. And, uh, and, and I'm just blown away. And I know I'm biased, but I'll say it. Y'all got a good preacher. And, um, and I love listening. And I love listening to him preach. I really do. 
And so thank you all for putting the services up like you do. Because there's some times where I just hadn't heard good preaching in a while because it's either all coming from me or I'm trying to find some church to go to and it just ain't as good. But, uh, but I, I don't have that. I don't know that I got that preacher gene. I've got more of the teacher gene in me. And so I tend to go Bible study. And I, I want to, tonight, I've really been kind of over the past week or so really kind of confused and struggling about what to talk about tonight and what to bring to us tonight and, and where to go. And, and right up into this afternoon, just been kind of back and forth with some stuff. And I was even praying on the way here and praying during the song service, Lord, it, you know, if you've got somewhere else to go, shift gears now because I'm about to go this direction. And, uh, and I want to start out tonight by telling you my story a little bit in my heart, my testimony, if you will. I, I know I haven't really shared my testimony with you folks. Now, I was a preacher's kid growing up. Duh. Uh, you know that part. You know that much. Um... I knew from an early, early age what it meant to be saved and what it meant to need to be saved. In fact, I remember I went to a Christian school in Athens, Georgia, uh, my kindergarten year, when I was just a, a wee tot, as they say. And I remember our teacher asking me one day while we were waiting on parents to come pick us up if I'd ever asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I remember just kind of being ashamed to say, no, I hadn't done that yet. Because I knew it was something that I needed to do. I knew that I needed Jesus to save me. Even at like five years old, I knew that. And it wasn't long after that that I made my way by myself to the altar one night during the invitation to just pray the best way I knew how as a five-year-old kid to ask Jesus to come into my heart. And I know in that moment, in that instant, I was saved. I know that Jesus saved me in a way that I can't understand even now as a grown-up. But especially not then as a five-year-old, I just knew I was trusting Jesus to save me. And I would later make it public and get baptized and all that good stuff. And as I grew up, I, I always say, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, y'all, I wasn't a bad kid. My mouth was bad, but I wasn't a bad kid. I never had a bad heart, never wanted to hurt anybody, never wanted to, I was never one of these troublemakers. I was never one of these people that were looking for trouble. Trouble always seemed to find me. And, uh, and I had a real passion as a teenager through middle school and high school. We called it junior high school when I was in it. Through junior high and high school, I had a real passion to, uh, to share Jesus, to, to bring. I, I was the guy that brought my Bible to school. I was the kid. Whenever evolution was brought up, I'd raise my hand and be like, what about the other view? You know, all that kind of stuff. And I was the kid that in class, whenever there was some type of religious discussion sparked, all eyes turned to me, and we would start it up and go. And... And people knew that I was not just the preacher's kid, but that I was saved. And I had some friends who were Christians, and we worked together and did different things in the school. We'd do the see at the polls and that sort of thing. I, at the time, in Jeff Davis County, they wouldn't let youth pastors come into the schools at all for any reason. And so there was a lot that was on the shoulders of the students to lead and to do, and we did that. And uh, it took me going to a Christian college to really find out what it is to struggle with sin and to fall away. And I hate to say that, but that's when I made my big life mistakes, was when I went to a Christian university. Because what happened there is what happens to a lot of us when we get into a Christian bubble. Myself and others, we let our guard down. We let our guard down. You see, we have an enemy. And 1 Peter 5.8 will tell you all about our enemy that we need to know. Peter says, be, al be alert, be awake, be on guard. Because your enemy, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the minute we let our guard down, the minute you kind of take your shields down and quit watching and quit being on alert and quit being on watch is when, is when, the, is when temptation comes in and you don't even see it, and before you know it, sin has taken you further than you want to go. I lived after that most of my life trying to make up for my mistakes, and that's what a lot of us do as believers. When we fall down, we try to make it up to God for falling down. We try to, we try to get, we, I, I, the, the phrase we always use is, well, I'm just trying to get back where I used to be with the Lord. I'm trying to get back to where I need to be. And for years, I was always trying to make up for my past mistakes and my regrets and my failures. 
And then one day, I was having lunch with a, with a friend of mine who's a pastor, and we were talking about the concept of grace. And I realized how scared I was of grace. I realized how scared I was of God's grace because God's grace took everything away from me and made it all about him. God's grace made my work meaningless for the glory of his work. God's, work, God's grace made my teaching a lot more limited than it ever was because I was your typical youth pastor teaching, now guys, don't party, don't drink, don't do drugs, you know, save yourself for marriage. And I was given all the list of do's and don'ts. I was preaching the big four, pray, read your Bible, go to church, witness. That's what I was teaching kids. I would give them truth right up in their face. I was very much a, a man of truth, and I believed in truth, un, unbridled, unfettered truth, and I still do. But the truth was never tempered with God's grace in my life. So it was that whenever I messed up, whenever I made a mistake, I'd end up beating myself up worse than anyone. I would carry my guilt, I would carry my regret, I would carry my shame. And then as this friend began to talk to me about just how big the grace of God is, I realized that I had become one of those believers who has trusted Jesus for my eternity, but I don't trust him for my right now. And an amazing thing began to happen to me as I began to open up my eyes and my heart and my mind and my spirit to the fullness of God's grace. The burden of regret dropped off. The burden of shame went away. I began to look at Scripture differently, and it, became, it began to come alive in a new and powerful way like I'd never known before because I was always looking just for some new truth to give to someone else. But as I began to look in the Scripture after that, what I found is Scripture began to speak to me down to my very core, and it began to change me, and the love of God began to be illuminated to me in a way that I'd never really believed and seen and known. I'm not saying I got saved again, but I am saying that God began to really do a work in my life like he'd never done because I needed it. It was at a time in my life where I desperately needed it, where regret had gotten too heavy, where mistakes had become piled up. You know, I wasn't on the deep end. I wasn't about to do anything crazy. I wasn't, doing, I wasn't out thinning every night, but it was just regret's this weird thing, man. It just keeps re attracting more and more regret with it. When you carry your regrets, it just keeps building up. And the smallest things, when you're trying to hide your regret, when you're trying to perform for everyone, when you're trying to make sure that you look just like you think everyone wants you to look, it can get tiring. It'll wear you out. And God stepped in and said, here's my grace. You don't carry this regret. You're my child. Why are you taking on this burden? Here's, here's, here is my burden. It's easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You take this and you run with this and see what happens. And it changed the way I loved people. It changed the way I loved my kids. It changed the way that I interacted with folks. It changed the way I loved the church. And for someone in ministry, y'all, that's a big deal because, because not all churches are like y'all. They aren't all nice. Some churches have some mean people in them. They really do. And sometimes those mean people start to get a voice in the church, and that's when it gets scary for those of us in ministry. And I remember being in a position in my life where some of those mean people were starting to get a voice, and I was just starting to fight back and swing back as hard as I could because I was so scared that I would look less than. When at the end of the day, God said, I've got you. Why are you worried about this? And it was all because of his grace. All because of his amazing, amazing grace. And so as we look at the topic we're going to look at tonight, it's a weird way to kind of open up into this topic. Because the topic we're going to be talking about tonight is our enemy. We're going to be looking at the tactics of the enemy and what we have to fight against the enemy. And it's weird that I just, as you know, as, as, as I began to pray this afternoon, and, and like I say, all week long I've been struggling about this, and 
coming in tonight as you guys were singing, it's like the Lord said, just tell a little bit of your story to start out. Because I want you to know tonight, I guess more than anything, and I think the Lord wants us to know, that tonight I'm not here to try to put the fear of anything into us because Scripture says we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That if we walk in fear as believers, we're starting from the wrong foot. We're walking in the wrong path. That we, we don't walk in fear of the enemy. We don't walk in fear of the world. We walk in the love, wrapped in the love and the grace of God. And that gives us the boldness to move forward in what God has called us to do. Several years ago, well, several years, several, several years ago, my first year as being a full-time youth pastor, in fact. <clears throat> Halloween, I noticed on the calendar that Halloween was going to fall on a Wednesday night. Now, I'm not, I don't like Halloween all that much. I like candy, you know. But I'm not big on dressing up or going to strangers and begging for candy. That just seems weird to me. And I don't know those people. And, you know, and, there, and there's no way. You can't dress this up, y'all. You can't hide who this is. They know. They know when they see me waddling up the carport. Oh, that's old Steve. It doesn't matter what I'm wearing. But Halloween was going to fall on a Wednesday, and I thought a neat concept would be to, leading up every Wednesday, leading up to Halloween through the month of October, that I would take my kids on kind of a, on a, on a weird journey, and we would start to kind of look at some of the more out there things that the enemy does and is in this world. Uh, we called it Four Weeks of Freaky because it was some freaky stuff we were talking about. And we, we looked at the occult and, and we looked at, this was right on the cusp of shows like Ghost Hunters and Paranormal Activity and all this other stuff going on. And, and, and we started to kind of dig into some of that. And, um, and, I, and I told him every week, look, we're not here to scare you. I'm not here to start a witch hunt. And I'm not here to cause you to get curious to look into these things. And tonight as we, as we talk about our enemy, I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to frighten you or, or arouse any undue curiosity that you might have for, to, to kind of dig more into who he is and what his plots are. I don't want to do anything to take focus away from the glory that we are owed, or that we, not that we are owed, but that we owe to God. I don't want to take anything away from the glory that is owed him but I feel like it's incumbent upon us, just like a good coach is going to study tape of the, of the other team, we need to know what's going to be going on on the other side because God's shown us in his word how the enemy is and what our enemy is really all about. Our desire is to glorify God and to equip ourselves to be able to stand and to be able to understand what is going on in this world. With this whole Bible study that we do, it became a yearly thing. And y'all, through the month of October, we would pack out. We had mobile units at this church I was at in Baxley. And we would pack out this long room in this mobile unit. Kids lying in the walls, sitting on the floor, standing room only. I had a little, y'all remember overhead projectors? This was in the days before all the good technology. I had an overhead projector, and I thought the coolest thing I'd ever done was find uh, transparency paper that you could... Uh, that you could print on, run through the printer, run through an inkjet printer. Oh, man, I was high on the hog. I'm like, watch me teach. Boom, and I was slapping down transparencies, and we were looking at stuff. And, it, and, and I mean, kids were piling in and piling in because, they're, because they were going back to school and saying, our youth pastor talked about this. This is crazy. Y'all gots to come. And, uh, and one night we were talking about a movement, a religion called Wicca. I don't know if y'all have heard of Wicca. Uh, Wicca is witchcraft. I mean, it's just pure and simple. It's witchcraft. And in fact, when I first started doing these studies, when I first started looking into this stuff, those people who practice Wicca did not want to be called witches at all. Within three years, there was no distinction. It was amazing how, how just subtly all these things started to kind of merge together. And we talked about that. But after our discussion of Wicca that night, I had a girl pull me over to the side. I realize I'm saying I a lot, and I'm sorry for that. I'm not trying to... I, see, I'm really uncomfortable not talking about this. I'm not trying to lift myself up. I'm just telling you my experiences. Had a girl pull me over to the side, and she said, Mr. Steve, can I talk to you? And I'm like, sure. And, uh, and so her friend's like, yes, she really needs to talk to you. I'm like, okay. 
And, uh, and we step outside of the side. She's like, are you sure all this stuff is bad? And I knew exactly what was coming. I'm like, yes, ma'am, I'm absolutely 100% sure that you're messing with stuff you have no idea what you're messing with if you're messing with this. And she's like, well, because I've, I've been into this before. She said, I'm not really heavy into it, but I'm into it. And I'm like, well, stop. Just get out. And it was amazing as this young girl really did struggle with the idea of everything that she thought was okay and good was wrong and evil and deceptive. And she came, and when the truth, when the light of the truth was shown on it, it, it changed her heart and it changed her mind about what she'd been involved in. You know, and we looked at some of the weird stuff. We talked about some of those shows that were starting to come up, those ghost hunting shows and everything. And, and we even talked about UFOs. And I know you're tuning me out when I say the words UFOs, but I actually called and talked to a fella down in uh, Florida, of all places. And y'all, there are some nut jobs down in Florida. Y'all know that? Um, anyone that would cheer for gators. But anyhow, <laughs> I talked to a fellow down in Florida that actually worked with an organization. You'd be surprised at what kind of organizations there are with all this stuff. He worked with an organization that would go out and interview people who had seen UFOs. If someone sighted a UFO, they would, they would, they would call a number or go onto a website log in the time and date, what they saw, where they were, all they could remember, and then they would be interviewed to see how credible they were. And then these people would link that up with data that they had about flight data and all this stuff. This guy got saved. His name was Joe, and he got saved. And, and I had the opportunity to talk to him, and I said, well, what, what changed your heart and mind about all this stuff? And he said, well, I tell you, he said, I'd gotten saved, and I was still doing this thing, and I don't know why I was. I was going to step out of it, but I felt like the Lord was leading me to just stick around a little bit longer. And then one day, someone called and, and wanted me. They, were, they didn't have the, the people on hand to be able to go handle this. He said, we never worked with abduction cases. Now, abduction cases where people think they've been taken by UFOs. And uh, he, said, he, said, I was, he said, they asked me to go interview someone who had been abducted and I went and I talked to him and and the guy said that he felt this weird sensation of being paralyzed of being lifted up off his bed he couldn't do anything he couldn't think to say anything and all he could do and all he could remember was going to Sunday school as a little boy and he just called out the name Jesus and everything stopped and he said and I had never in all my years of researching this stuff heard or seen that so I started calling around to some of these psychologists who had worked with these people and started asking them if they'd ever seen that. And they said, yeah, that happens all the time. We just don't know what to do with it, so we don't write it up. And I said, are you telling me? I said, who told you? He said, they all told me off the record that this is something that happens on a regular basis. And he's like, no one will go on record with it. Because they don't know, because they're all secular humanists who don't believe in God, who don't believe in Jesus, and they refuse to accept that there's a spiritual component to these things. I'm like, well, all right. That's interesting. That's amazing, in fact. And I tell you what's really amazing is when you look at the stories of these, uh, these alien encounters, as funny and weird as that may be, and you compare it to some of the stories on those ghost hunting shows, they're very similar. A lot of things happen that are just the same. And I happen to know in the book of 1 John that John tells us that all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all Satan's got. He's not very creative. So if he can take the same thing and dress it up in something a little bit different, why not? Why not? Anything because... The other thing that Mr. Joe told me from down in Florida, he said, you look at any of this UFO stuff, he said, no one ever points back to a creator. No one ever points back to God. It's all a distraction away from who God is. And I'm like, that's really good. I never, I, wow, you're right. And all the stuff that I looked into, there was never any talk of Christianity, the Bible, or anything. They try to do these ancient UFO stuff and make stuff silly, but it's not. It's, it's ridiculous, the stuff that people do. But there's, there's a reaction we have to this stuff a lot of times. If it's on TV, it's fake. 
If someone's telling the story, it didn't really happen. They were just half asleep or, you know, we don't believe it. It's just ridiculous. This is silliness. This is silly stuff. I want to propose to you something else because I'm just crazy enough to propose this to you. I want to propose to you that, um, that we have an enemy who will go to great lengths if it means keeping people out of the kingdom of God. We have an enemy that will do anything in his power and anything that he can to keep people from knowing the saving power of Jesus Christ. And if he can make you think that it's all just a bunch of silliness, if he can make us all think as believers that there's nothing to any of it, guess what? We're not going to do anything about it. We'll sit here happy, thinking people are crazy. When the truth of the matter is, is that some of it's hoax, some of it's made up, some of it's, a lot of it is very explainable. But there's a small enough percentage of it where I really believe, and, I, and this is just me, this ain't the Holy Spirit speaking. I'm not going to claim Jesus in this one, but I'm going to say that I really believe with everything that I am that there's a small percentage of it that's the enemy at work. And there's a lot that's being done in our lives to desensitize us to the work of the enemy in this way through the matters of the occult and through all this other paranormal stuff, as they call it. Remember black and white scary movies? Remember what they were? It was like the big ones were like based on literature and legend, Frankenstein's monster, you know, big old Boris Karloff with bolts in his neck, Wolfman, Dracula. You know, then before you know it, Abbott and Costello were hanging out with the Wolfman and, and, and Dracula and Frankenstein and all this stuff. The other scary movies were like giant. What they would do is they'd film like a tarantula and then superimpose that onto like a drive-in movie. And, and it would look like a giant tarantula coming at you. Those were the scary movies back in the day. Eventually, the scary movies became like some weird murderer killer man, you know, in a hockey mask or with a, with a glove made of knives and that sort of thing. And, and then those guys became like icons in pop culture. Nowadays, have you, ever, have you seen any of the previews for like what passes as scary movies these days? Y'all, I have to turn the channel. It scares me to death. You've got people playing with Ouija boards, interacting with demonic spirits, being possessed. That's what passes as scary movies these days. And you know why? so that we're all desensitized to that stuff. So that when that kind of thing becomes the norm for people just to get around and sit down and play with these things and toy with these things and toy with the occult, that we look at it as some game, some movie, something they just saw, and it's no big deal. Now again, I'm telling you tonight, I'm not here on a witch hunt and I'm not bringing this up to be a witch hunt, but I am saying that we are commanded. First Peter tells us, be alert, be on guard, know what's happening, know what's going on around you. Because your enemy, the devil, is roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we're losing, we're losing people to this dark, dark, dark stuff that the enemy would do. We're losing them. Because we will write it off as no big deal. We will write it off as, as thinking that's just something from Hollywood, that's just something on TV. But one of the things that happened as we were doing this Bible study is I found out how much of it was actually going on in our area, at least in Appling County at the time. And y'all, and, and I've said this, and I've talked to people about this, if God put me back in Appling County doing full-time youth ministry, I'd be, I'd be completely fine with that because it is a safe place and a great place for, for youth pastors there in Appling County. They love youth ministry in Appling County. The school systems love youth ministry. They want the youth pastors there in the schools as much as possible. It's, it's great. It's wonderful. But I was shocked to find out that underneath the surface what was going on and how many kids were getting sucked in, not just kids, but young adults getting sucked into things like Wicca and the occult. I was shocked to find that there was a man living in Appling County at one point who had been, for lack of a better term, really high up in a branch of, uh, in a group that had, had broken off of the satanic church. They broke away from the satanic church because it got too commercial for them. And they wanted to delve deeper into the dark stuff. And there was a fellow who, he lived in Appling County that he was high up in that. And I, I, 
I did not go meet him. I was not about to go interact with this person. But I, 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 I almost did. I had his address. I had, a, I had a place just to go talk to him and find out what he's all about. I just couldn't bring myself to do it because I'm kind of chicken, you know. I'll preach not walking in fear, but don't ask me not to. Gee whiz, what are y'all talking about? But I was shocked. I was shocked and amazed. And then when I got over to Jeff Davis County, and y'all, I don't mean to point fingers at other counties. I know Brantley County has its problems and stuff, but I don't know y'all like I know those places. I'm just telling you what I know in the, in the areas, in the little areas that are a lot like Brantley County. Though we don't want to say we're like Applin County, and they don't want to say y'all, they're like y'all, and, and y'all don't want to say you're like Jeff Davis County. We don't want to say we're like, we're all, I mean, these little small counties, y'all, we're a lot alike in a lot of ways. And I was amazed to find out in Jeff Davis County just how much occult practice had gone on over the years. And just kind of right under the surface. From teenagers just experimenting with stuff to guys really getting deep into some stuff. And it, it'll, it, it blew my mind and it kind of broke my heart because I'm like, how does this happen? How does this happen when you have people who I know love the Lord? Uh, when you have believers who are walking around who I know love Jesus, what are we doing? And what it comes down to is, is we really think, oh, not here. Not, that's something that happens out in the tribes in South America. You know, that's something they're doing down in Uganda with chicken feet or some such. But no, these things happen at our doorstep and they're happening on our movie screens. They're happening on our TV screens. And, and, and people are becoming more and more and more desensitized to it as we go along. Our enemy has a mission. His mission is destruction. He wants to destroy lives. He wants to destroy lives and he wants to destroy eternities. If he can take someone to hell, then he has won a victory. Because here's what Satan knows that I don't think we always get. Satan knows that God's most important priority is you. God's number one priority is people. How do I know that? Because he gave his life for us. He bled and died for us. And Satan knows that if he can destroy your life, that if he can take someone to hell, he knows that he's won a victory. And so his mission is destruction. Jesus said it in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what he's after. Someone once told me, some wacko Christian person, and I say, I use the word Christian lightly, they're like, well, you know, the devil ain't got no power. That verse says he's, he's just walking around like a roaring lion. He doesn't have any teeth. He's just roaring. He's just trying to scare you. I'm like, then why is he looking for something to eat? He will chew you up and spit you out, and if he has to gum you to death, I'm pretty sure he'll do that too. He is not afraid. He is not powerless. And he grows, it seems like he grows in power more and more and more every day as we see the day of the Lord approaching. That's what's going to happen. Sin is going to abound more and more. We're going to see this taking place and we have to be on guard because he is in the destruction business. And he will do it however he can. If it means lifting a table up off the ground while some people are holding hands around a lit candle, he'll do it. If it means moving a little piece of, 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 of plastic around a board to spell out words, he'll do it. If it means showing up looking like grandma at the foot of your bed, he'll do it. If it means having someone say they've got a word from beyond for you, he'll do it. Satan will do whatever it takes to destroy lives. There's nothing he won't attempt. And we need to be on guard. We need to be alert. His favorite weapon is deception. Turn over to the book of John chapter 8. That's what Satan will do. And this, is, and this is how he works. He's got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the way he gets us to fall in all these things is his favorite tool, the thing that he uses, his weapon of choice, is deception. John chapter 8, this is an amazing story because it starts out pretty, pretty mean. The Pharisees are being pretty hard on Jesus. They're saying some nasty things to him. And this is one of those moments where Jesus snaps back. I love Jesus for two reasons. Well, many reasons, but there are two things that I love about Jesus now that he saved me. I love the fact that Jesus loves food. 
We've covered that before. You know, you look after him after he rose from the dead. What did he do? He was breaking bread with the guys on the road to Emmaus. He ate when he was in the room with the disciples to show them that he was alive. And he was cooking breakfast there at the end of the book of John for Peter. Love Jesus for that. The other thing I love about Jesus is he was a little bit sarcastic. He could be a little bit snappy when he needed to be. And here in John chapter 8, the Pharisees are really up in Jesus' face. <clears throat> and, and they're talking to Jesus about who his father is. And they're casting aspersions on Jesus' heritage. Because they don't believe in the virgin birth. And so he's having this conversation with him. Start in verse 31 here. And we'll just read a little bit, read this conversation a little bit. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does not remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. See, Jesus, they started questioning Jesus. We're not enslaved to anybody. Jesus is like, well, I know what you think, but let me just tell you what I've seen. You're wanting to kill me. I've seen these things because I've been communicating with the Father. You're wanting to do these things because of who your Father is. And what he goes on. And they answered Jesus and said, Abraham is our father. Verse 39. And Jesus said to them, If you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. See how Jesus is building up? He's trying to get him to ask. He wants them to ask, well, who do you think our father is? He's wanting them to. I love Jesus so much in these moments. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. I'm sorry, I got back on verse 39. Verse 41, they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. That's where they really hit Jesus. They're telling Jesus, listen, your mama out of wedlock got pregnant with you, buddy. And that's not how we were born. So now they're questioning Jesus' heritage. And Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Well, if God were your father, you'd love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Here it is, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Listen to this. Because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's who our enemy is. Satan, he says, whenever he speaks a lie, he's speaking from his own nature. He's telling it, it really goes on really cool here because this is where it ends up where Jesus says, look, I don't know what your problem is. You say you're Abraham's descendants. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And the Pharisees say, well, how do, how do you know that? You're not even 50 years old. How do you know Abraham? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And that's when they get blown back. But right here is where we're wanting to focus on. He says, listen, this is from the words of Jesus telling us about the enemy, letting us know who this person is. He says he is a liar, and not just a liar. It's not just in his nature to lie. He is the father of lies. Satan can lie so fast it'll make your head spin, and you won't know which way is left or right. He did it in the garden, and he does it to this day with us. And we all know how to lie to ourselves. Come on. I have gone for years looking in the mirror saying, I'm not that big. I, and I avoid the scale because the scale will tell me how big I am, and then I know the truth, and the truth has to set me free. You see, we're good at lying to ourselves. We're good at saying, well, you know what? I might be doing this, but oh, so-and-so over there. We won't say it out loud. So-and-so is worse than I am, so I'm okay. 
This can't be that bad. It's all right. We know, and that's Satan. That's how he works to start out with. But the other thing, and we've seen this before when we look at those temptations of Christ, Satan knows this book, and he knows it so well, he will take the truth and he will twist it just a little bit. Whew, that's the worst kind of lie. The lie that's a little bit true, it's just twisted. He'll do that, and he'll deceive you. He is a deceiver. How much of a deceiver is he? Jump over, if you will, really quickly to 2 Corinthians. I think 2 Corinthians, I've lost my notes. Yes, yeah, 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Paul's talking about false teachers here. And Paul puts these false teachers in the same boat as the enemy. And look what he says about the enemy here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. He says, No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Did you know that the, pe the reason people get into this stuff that, where they dabble in the occult and all this stuff, it never starts out ugly and scary and everybody wearing black and putting dark makeup around their eyes. It always starts out with someone saying, this is my way to have some type of power, some type of freedom. This is my way to really understand more than I've ever understood. Sometimes it's, e it's even as simple as, all these people over here cast me out, but I'm welcome in this group. I have to see what they're about. A false sense of love and security. Satan wraps himself up as an angel of light. The saddest thing that could ever happen is for there to be a church in a town and someone feel like they're not welcome there. The saddest thing that could ever happen is someone to come here and feel powerless and feel alone and feel unloved. If that ever happens, the church needs to shut its doors. Because no one should ever feel that way. And when that happens, a lot of times there are these other groups who are ready to receive you. Man, we look... We all feel, we're all outcasts. We want the same thing you do. Those Christians look at us really badly too. So come on in. We're not that weird. You'll find out some stuff. You'll learn truth. You'll learn power. You'll learn Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Our response to the enemy has to be, be a careful one. Jude 9, Jude is an amazing little book. It's only one chapter. It's really short. It is a setup in a neat way. It's a setup for the book of Revelation because it gets you thinking in an Old Testament mentality because there are a lot of Old Testament references there in the book of Jude. And Jude verse 9 talks about this weird instance. I say weird because I don't understand it where Michael and Satan are fighting over the body of Moses. And as they're fighting, Scripture tells us that Michael didn't even rebuke Satan, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael said, I'm not powerful enough to do this in my own strength. The Lord rebuke you. In the book of Zechariah, God would say through the prophet to, to the governor Zerubbabel, which is a fun name to say, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Our response as Christians need to be cautious, resting wholly and fully in the spirit of God. Trusting in his power, not our own strength, not our own knowledge, not our own wisdom, not anything. But just knowing that he is the power, he is who we rest in. And we have to listen to him in 1 Peter when he says, Be alert, be awake, stay on guard. When you let your guard down, you get picked off. Boom, boom, boom. The enemy sneaks up on you and takes you down. You've got to be alert. You've got to be on guard. You've got to know what's going on. The second thing is, when we're alert, we're, we're rarely caught by surprise. Well, duh. I've got a friend, and he and I are kind of the same way. If you walk up on us and try to scare us, we might jump on the inside, but we try not to jump on the outside because we don't want you to know you got us. And, uh, and so we're always trying to kind of, you know, scare each other, you know, kind of pop out around a corner at each other. 
it's usually a good two years apart before we do it because we, you know, hoping the other one will let their guard down. It used to kill my pastor back when I was in Appling County. He'd always try to walk in the room and, hey, boy, and I just wouldn't jump. And he'd be like, I never get you, do you? And I'm thinking, if you only knew. <laughs> but when you let your guard down, if you, let your, if, you, if you keep your guard up, you're never caught by surprise. If you recognize the fact that the enemy's coming after you, you'll always be expecting his attacks. And we have to gear up for those attacks. We have to be ready. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us the weapons of this war that we're called in are not carnal. They're not man-made. That's an amazing passage of Scripture to break down and see what the weapons of God that he's given us is for. I'd encourage you in your own Bible study time, spend some time there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. And we all know the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And for time's sake, we're not going to turn there and read it, but I'll tell you... Paul lays it out for us, this armor of God. And it's not about the pieces of armor, as we've said before. It's about what, they, what he uses to illustrate them. He says, put on truth. How do, why put on truth? To overcome the lies, to recognize the lies. When you know the truth, forwards and backwards, there is no lie and no twisted truth that can ever escape your eye. You're going to know the lie when you see it, when you're wrapped in truth. Righteousness. He calls righteousness a breastplate. Righteousness helps us overcome sin. So many times in, in teaching kids about purity and that sort of thing, the question always comes up, well, how far can I go? And I always say that's the wrong question. The question you need to ask yourself is, how pure can I be? Because if you're asking how far can I go, you're always going to be able to talk yourself into a little bit farther. And that's with any situation in life, ladies and gentlemen. But righteousness, when we're concerned with the righteousness of God, when we put that on, when we wear that, it protects us from sin and we overcome sin. The preparation of the gospel, Paul says, why? So that as we're going through this world, we're always ready to, to win others. We're always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Let me tell you something. One of the, one of the biggest downfalls for people when they, is when they have questions about our faith, when they question why, and all we want to do is say, oh, I don't know, you'll have to talk to the preacher. One of the biggest things that's going to hurt and keep people from coming to Jesus is our lack of preparation. I'm not talking about going out and banging down doors or, or, or cornering people at Walmart and saying, Hey, do you know Jesus? I'm just talking about being ready in your day-to-day -day life when someone has a question. That's what the preparation of the gospel is. It's being prepared with the gospel. It's being ready to give an answer. It's being ready, how's it say, in season and out of season. That's what preparation of the gospel is. That as we're going, we're ready. Paul goes on in that armor. He says the shield of faith. Faith, how? Why? To defeat doubt. If you've never doubted in your walk as a believer, then bless your heart. You are blessed beyond words because most believers I know have dealt with doubt in their life, whether it's doubting whether or not they were really saved, whether it's doubting what God can really do for them, whether it's doubting the work of God in their life, doubting what God has led them to do. Let me tell you something. Doubt, whew, doubt is, it, it gets on you. If it gets on you and gets on you good, it can mess you up in a big way. And it is faith that overcomes doubt. And our faith, this is the amazing thing about faith, is God doesn't expect you to develop your own faith. He gives us faith. And as we trust Him more and more, we're given more and more. It's, it's, this, it's this neat circle that God does. God gives us a measure of faith to trust Him. And that faith begins to grow. And when we carry that faith, when doubt comes, we just say, God, I'm going to trust you. It's just like the centurion said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, in the places where I'm doubting, I'm coming to you trusting to take care of those doubts. That's faith. And we've got to make sure we've got it. Salvation. Paul says the helmet of salvation. Salvation identifies us to the world. It identifies us to the enemy. It identifies us as I am not my own. I am bought with a price. The blood of Jesus has covered me. And that's who I am. And when we walk in that identity, we walk as a child of God. If you can get in your mindset that your salvation didn't just change your eternal address, but it changed your eternal person. 
It changed your identity. If you can know who you are in Christ, then you will walk in Christ the way that you should walk. It's plain and simple. Because you're going to be who you're supposed to be. And finally, man, Paul says that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And how much do we need the Word of God in our lives? For encouragement, for strength, to fortify us, to, to help us understand more and more and more deeply. But also, as Timothy tells, Paul tells us in Timothy, that it is good for doctrine. That tells you what's right. It is good for reproof. That tells you you're not right. It's good for correction. That tells you how to get right. And it's good for instructions in righteousness. That tells you how to stay right. That's the word. And as we carry that sword, we carry it in a way that slices through all the junk that's out there. That's the armor of God. That's what he has. Gear up, believer. Be alert, believer. Know what's out there. And understand that in your lifetime and in my lifetime, we may never really fully encounter face-to-face -face some of those stranger, darker things of the enemy. But we can never discount those things. We have to take those along with all the little subtle sneaky stuff Satan does. And let me tell you something. That's what you're going to encounter more around here than anything else. You're going to encounter those little twisted truths. Truths that are twisted ever so slightly into lies. You're going to encounter choosing the good over the godly. You're going to encounter stuff where the enemy will try to throw things at you that seems okay, but you know it's shifting your priorities and it's shifting who you are in Christ or trying to. So be alert, friends. Be geared up. There's no need to go hunting after the enemy. Hear what I'm telling you. Don't go Satan hunting. There's no need to go looking for the enemy. He will come to you. Believe you me. What we need to be hunting is for people. We need to go out. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. A fisher, uh, I, I don't understand fishing all that much, but I know the way I do it never works because I plop down in one place and just sit there and cast off and, and never move because I'm a little too lazy to do that. And then I only sit there about five minutes. But what I really understand about fishing from what I've seen on some of these shows is you've got to go where the fish are. You've got to be ready to move. You've got to know where to cast. We're supposed to be going after people that way. Not, not after the enemy. And a lot of us, I say us, believers, a lot of us have wasted a lot of breath and time trying to chase down the enemy when the enemy's knocking right at our doorstep. You don't, have to have, you don't have to hunt the enemy. He'll come after you. But the truth of the, of the matter is this tonight, and I want to end with this encouragement for you. I know it's been a simple message. I know a lot of us have sat here and said, well, I know all that, I know that, I know that. But I just want to encourage you tonight this amazing truth. There's an old song. It says simply, the blood will never lose its power. That we have victory in Jesus, another great old song. Why? Because of the love of God. God has given us victory. Man, we, we are not starting at, we're not starting on a level playing field against our enemy zero to zero. And who's going to score the most points in the end? The game is won. The, the war is won. There are some individual battles along the way. But man, if you'll walk, if you will walk in who Jesus has created you to be, if you'll just be alert, keep your guard up, stay geared up, man, you'll know victory as a believer. You'll know victory. And we are so thankful for the victory we have in Jesus today. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for the victory you've granted us, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you've given us a game plan. Lord, that you've revealed the enemy's tactics that we never have to be caught off guard or by surprise. And Lord, that even when we come against that which seems weird or strange or, or fearful, Lord, that we don't have to walk in fear. 
that we can walk in your glory and in your strength and in your power. I pray that in this time you'd move in our hearts and lives and encourage us with your grace and love. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing Just a Closer Walk with Thee, 448. Let's sing our benediction as we go. Love it, it makes. 